Hello, I'm Suzette Field of A Curious Invitation. Welcome to the 32 Londoners podcast series. Along with Stephen Coates of Antique Beat, on May the 1st, I curated an extraordinary event on the EDF energy, London Eye. For one rotation, each of the eye's 32 capsules was occupied by a speaker giving a talk about one of 32 significant born Londoners to a small audience. Here is Essie Fox on the singer Mary Lloyd. Welcome to the London Eye. As you know, I'll be talking about Mary Lloyd tonight, a superstar of the London halls and theatrical entertainments whose career spanned the later 19th century and the earlier part of the 20th century. And yet, very often, when I've mentioned her name to people recently, younger people, even not that young, have actually said to me, well, who was Mary Lloyd? I think that shows just how ephemeral fame can be and how the years so often dim collective treasured memories because in her time, Mary Lloyd was the one and only, the beloved queen of the music halls, famed at home and internationally, and who at the time of her funeral was mourned by up to 100,000 fans who lined the streets of London even though they'd never met her. I wish I could have met her because I think she could have told me some wonderful tales when I was writing my first novel, The Somnambulist. And that's, I only mention that because it's based on a fictional family who live in the East End of London, who have strong links to the music halls, in particular to Wilton's, which is in the Wapping Whitechapel area. <laughs> and Wilton's still opens its doors to the public today for various shows and also for tours. And if you ever go there, I'm, I'm sure that, um, just like me, that despite the building's state of decay, as soon as you walk in through the doors into the hall itself, you'll feel as if you've been transported back in time, right back to its Victorian heyday. You can almost hear the shop, the pop of champagne corks, the laughter and singing, the instruments playing, and you can imagine the chandelier above that once sparkled on mirrors on the walls around. You can still see the cast iron barley, piss twillers, barley twist pillars that hold up the balcony and the glorious papier-mâché frieze that laps around that. And Anybody that stands up in that balcony near to the stage can actually reach down with their arms and actually touch anybody on that stage because that's how intimate that venue is. And you may wonder why as I'm telling you about Wilton's. It's simply because it wouldn't have been all that different from the venues where Mary Lloyd performed at the very start of her career. So if you wanted to get an idea of that sort of place, you could go there and you could really feel that atmosphere. I wanted to give you some idea of that sort of setting where there would have been costas and dockers and West End swells who tip top hats while slumming it with the East End shop girls and prostitutes and over whose whistles shouts and laughs through the fog of cigar smoke and the fumes of gas and without any aid of a microphone, which is something we forget about very often today, Mary Lloyd would have had nothing more than her confidence and her charisma with which to reach out and touch that audience and to have them eating out of her hand. I don't think she sang at Wilton's because that hall would have been closed down for immoral behaviour and decadence when a charming, cheeky East End girl made her debut at the Grecian Hall, which is situated in Hoxton and only a street or two away <laughs> and only a street or two away from where the queen of the halls had been born and spent her childhood years um, and before i just go on and, and tell you about where she was born in her childhood um, chris has actually got uh, two two lots of sheets with some pictures of murray just so that you can see what she looked like i'm sure most of you know anyway but to get an idea murray was born on the 12th on February the 12th, 1870, and she lived at number 36 Plummer Street, what is now known as Provost Street today, in Hoxton. Her father's <laughs> name was John Brushwood. Brush being a nickname because he was rather fond of his appearance and liked to be smartly dressed and never went out and about without a clothes brush in his pocket. 
He was also quite artistic, employed in the making of artificial silk flowers, but he also used to boost the family coffers by waiting on tables in halls and bars, of which there were very many around, with Hoxton being in the midst of the East End's thriving theatrical world. John's wife was called Matilda. They got married when she was just 17, and she was a dressmaker by trade, with quite a talent for design, and that talent was inherited by her daughter, which came in very useful later on, when Mari often designed and made the costumes that she wore on stage. But I'm running ahead of a bit of myself there, because back to Matilda, Alice, Victoria Wood, more usually known as Tilly, that's how she was christened, and she was one of 11 siblings, of whom nine survived to adulthood. She was headstrong and determined as a child, and she spent far more time playing truant from school than sitting behind a desk. Mm -hmm. She loved to go back home, stay with her mother, and look after her younger family members, and she used to organise them all in singing games. She was always dramatic by nature, and she loved being the centre of attention, so much so that when she was very young, she used to go around the local graveyards and then weep and wail so convincingly that complete strangers would think that she was actually grieving someone, for someone that had died, but she wasn't at all. She just wanted to be the centre of attention. <laughs> Eventually, her passion was more convincingly directed into the Fairy Bell Minstrels, which was a family singing act. And while Tilly's brother Johnny very often sold programmes to advertise the events, she and her other siblings performed, decked up in the costumes that their mother made while appearing at the Nile Street Sunday School or at the Hoxton Hall, which was then known as the Blue Ribbon Gospel Temperance Mission in a somewhat more spiritual guise than as a music hall. And its ownership um, then would bring in the children and they would sing lyrics about the dangers and the evils of alcohol. Songs such as, throw down the bottle and never drink again, which, as you will come to discover, proved to be somewhat ironic when we consider Murray's later years. For then, Murray was still Tilly, and Tilly's only addiction was a burning ambition to go on stage, an ambition no doubt encouraged by the fact that her mother's sister, Louisa, actually worked in the music halls as a dancer and would transform herself into Madame Patty. Um, I think that the stage struck Tilly would have been encouraged by her hard-working, respectable parents probably to not go on stage at first and they encouraged her to take up some jobs. First of all, making shoes for little children and then in the curling of feathers for hats. But that job didn't last very long at all because when the factory foreman came in and found Tilly up on the table singing to the rest of the girls, she was sacked on the spot. Um, I think by then Tilly's parents were forced to agree, in the words of their daughter later on, that they couldn't kick their objections as high as she could kick her legs. And so John Wood arranged for his Tilly to make her debut at the Grecian Hall, which was served by the Eagle Tavern, which was what happened to be um, both of them part of the same complex on the corner of Shepherdess Walk where it adjoins the city road, very near to the Old Street roundabout. Was Tilly nervous that first night when she performed as Matilda Wood, when even with her father nearby to keep an eye on everything, we can only imagine the rush in her blood when she put on her costume while still at home and then made her way to the music hall. And we know exactly what she wore, a figure hugging, hugging bodice and a skirt to show her petticoats, and on her head a mantilla of lace to drape around her golden curls, through which shone blue eyes and very prominent large white teeth in a face that wasn't conventionally beautiful, but she did exude charisma. And her personality set her apart when she stood behind the bright stage lights and braved whatever cacophony was going on in the hall below and sang a sentimental song entitled In the Good Old Days, which was probably rather slow and nostalgic for someone so very young. But that was swiftly followed on by a ditty, My Soldier Laddie, and then she danced an Irish jig. That debut performance went so well that invitations came rolling in for the singer, now going under the name of Miss Bella Della Mare, to appear in halls all around the East End, and also as far as Collins, Islington, the Hammersmith Temple of Varieties, and <laughs> <laughs> the Middlesex Hall in Drury Lane. And despite some early controversy, when Bella stole ballads from other stars and was threatened with legal injunctions, 
she somehow had the wit and the nerve to carry on and to get away with all of that. And her future was finally ensured when performing at Bethnal Green's Seabright Hall when, ooh, <laughs> when she met the composer George Ware, who then became her manager and who gifted the girl with a new stage na name from then on to be known as Mari. Mari as in starry, which was thought to be more sophisticated with that ooh la la nuance of being French. And the Lloyd part was said to have come from just observing a copy of Lloyd's weekly newspaper, although it could have been the Lloyd's on a box of matches. We don't really know the truth of that. But George Ware's greatest gift of all was to give his new protege a song one that had previously be been performed by the singer Nellie Power, but never with the same success as when the 16-year-old Mary Lloyd performed The Boy I Love at the Falstaff Hall on Old, Old Street, after which her rise was really meteoric. Her earnings were soon so lucrative that she could afford to pay other composers to create unique material, songs suiting her brazen ad-lib style such as Wacky Wack or Tiggy Voo or When You Wink the Other Eye, during which she would give what soon became Murray Lloyd's trademark expression, a knowing smile and a cheeky wink, not to mention that high-kicking dancing style designed to expose silk bloomers, of which the writer Compton McKenzie, who saw her perform when he was very young, was later to write that he had been amazed that any girl should have the courage to let the world see her drawers as definitely as Mari Lloyd. <laughs> well, perhaps when he saw that, she might have been singing these lyrics from the tale of the skirt which went, <laughs> by correct manipulation, she her figure can display and the ankles and the uh, uh, well, it's hard to turn the eye away, and she murmurs, saucy monkey, when a rude boy shouts, what ho? Well, whatever they shouted, the eyes of all would have been wide in amazement during a London pantomime when, egged on by her co-star, Little Titch, Murray knelt down to pray by a bed and then started reaching underneath it as if she was searching for a chamber pot. And the audience thought that was hilarious, though Augustus Harris, the director, was absolutely appalled and insisted she never do it again. But he never could quite restrain Murray's character and natural ebullience. And for that and for other such vulgarities, such as during one of Murray's acts when she struggled with a parasol and then proclaimed when it was up, <gasps> Thank God I haven't added up for months. <laughs> she was to offend more prurient souls, even if what was deemed outrageous then would be viewed as mild innuendo now. Still, a woman called Laura Orniston Chant, who was really like a Mary Whitehouse figure in those days, was so appalled that she eventually campaigned for Mary Lloyd to be called up before the theatre's vigilance committee. And... Um, that was specifically in relation to the scatological inferences in the lyrics of a popular song, I Sits Amongst the Cabbages and Peas. And that alluded to outside lavatories, um, which were built at the bottom of gardens, and where, as the lyrics quaintly describe, a young woman sits and shells with ease till the pretty little pea pot's full of bees. And imagine singing that too fast and how sits and shells might get confused. <laughs> but Mary was clever and worked her charm, offering to change the words to cabbages and leeks instead, which really was taking the, well, I think you know what I mean. But while still before the committee, Mary sang Oh, Mr. Porter, a song about going too far on a train and too far in other ways as well. And then a little bit of what you fancy does you good. And both so coy and demurely done that no one could find a thing to condemn. And finally, in an act of defiance, she sang the lyrics of Tennyson's poem, Come Into the Garden Maud, with such a carnal, knowing air as every <coughs> utterance of come that everyone present was stunned into silence because Mary Lloyd had made her point obscenity was all in the mind and her career could not be stopped by honest enchant or anyone else rather than being banned from the stage she went on to receive rave reviews and the one I'm going to read to you now is from black and white magazine a magazine all about the stage when at the age of 29 Mari had the starring role in the pantomime Dick Whittington Firstly, Miss Murray Lloyd is the dick, and a better dick, a more kind-heartly, jolly young blade you will not find in London town this season. Apart from her natural gift of jollity, which no one can deny, Miss Lloyd has serious claims to be considered an artist. Oh, I fancy some of my superior readers lifting their eyebrows and exclaiming, What? Murray Lloyd, an artist? 
But yes, indeed, if you have one scrap of appreciation for art in your soul, you roar when she sings and winks that roguish eye of hers. You roar so heartily that you forget to ask why you roar and how you roar. Her songs are often, alas, mere badly rhymed strings of inanities. Her speech is silly, punning lengths. But it is not exactly what she says, it's the clever way she says it that brings an audience to her feet. She knows when to be restrained, when to be ebullient. She may be vulgar at times, but she is always humorous. And she has the faculty of captivating her audience by talking and singing to them rather than at them. Then she can make her brilliant white teeth flash on you so suddenly that you are dazzled. Her wink tickles you, her smile warms you, her chuckle rouses you to responsive merriment. But it is useless trying to set down in the space of half a column the multifarious delights of Miss Lloyd's art. She is great and she must be seen to be appreciated. You go doubting, you come away her slave. This view was shared by others such as the poet T.S. Eliot, who insisted that Miss Murray Lloyd had the capacity for expressing the soul of the people, which made her something quite unique. Well, Murray was certainly unique, unashamedly singing her risque songs, all delivered with guts and gusto, and her fans far less prudish than we might suppose, for they liked nothing more than to have some fun, and Murray dished out the fun in spades, and she did leave the audience her slaves. But, for every conquest made from the stage at the height of Mary Lloyd's career, her love life was never such a success. She was first married at 17, when her private life might have mirrored her act, when she might have gazed up at the balcony while singing the words of this famous song, and please join in when I do just a little bit. <laughs> the boy I love is up in the gallery, the boy I love is looking now at me. There he is, can't you see, waving his handkerchief as merry as the robin that sings on a tree. I won't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> the boy who gazed back down was most likely her brother Johnny, who at that cue would smile and wave his handkerchief about. But I like to think that now and then it would have been Percy Courtney, the silver-tongued stage door, door Johnny and racecourse ticket tout of whom we don't know very much at all, except that he hailed from Streatham <coughs> and managed to steal Mari's heart and also he stole her virginity. A baby daughter, Maria, was born six months after the wedding day. The newlyweds had a marital home in two rooms in a house in Arlington Square, which was just off the new North Road, sort of that way again. But this was far from a dream come true. Mari's pregnancy left her shell-shocked, fearing that her career was now over and done. And she also discovered she'd married a drunkard, a man who frequently gambled their money and was jealous of his wife's success, resenting her friendships with theatre friends such as Dan Lino and Little Titch, Lottie Collins and Al Albert Chevalier. The friends who, just like her huge family, were welcome to any time of the day or night with her home run more like an informal hotel. The rift between Murray and Percy was soon irreparable. She exhausted herself with theatre work, throwing herself into pantomimes which were lucrative and near enough at home to be able to be in touch with her child all the time, but physically demanding. And the runs would go on for months on end. And perhaps it's little wonder that Murray at this time in her life had a second pregnancy that resulted in a miscarriage. Murray was only 19 years old, but she was determined to carry on, and carry on she did with style at the Empire and Alhambra, Leicester Square, the Trocadero of Shaftesbury Avenue, and the Royal Standard in Victoria. It was during a pantomime, Little Bo Peep, that Percy Courtney, entirely drunk, broke into her dressing room one night and attempted to slash her throat with a sword that was used as one of the stage props. There was another occasion when he beat her with a walking stick, screaming in the street for all to hear, I will gouge out your eyes and ruin you! Enough was enough. Murray left their home to embark on a tour of America, and when she returned to England, a restraining order was enforced to prevent her husband coming anywhere near, by which time she was otherwise involved with the singer Alec Hurley. Alec Hurley was a gentle bear of a man who'd been raised just a mile or two from Murray's own family home in Hoxton. 
solid and dependable, the ex-costerman and tea store clerk, was also to share his lover's stage. And during a 10-year courtship, the handsome Cockney couple traveled as far as America, Australia, South Africa. They shared many interests, including trips to the races, for which they kept houseboats on the Thames. There was sunbeam for use during the day and moonbeam for use during the evenings, and much talk that sometimes their occupants ended up in the river when a racing meet had gone particularly well. Um, but they shared also a house in Hampstead, but they never forgot their East End friends, proud of being working class right down to their very bootstraps, even going so far as to show support when the Amalgamated Musicians' Union went on strike for fairer pay, when Alex and Murray helped to fund and support the Music Hall start strike of 1907, and that just a year after they wed, when her divorce had finally come through. But by then there were wars going on at home as well. And the lyrics that Alec was famous for, I Ain't Nobody in particular, <laughs> reflected the fact that many now addressed him as Mr. Murray Lloyd, or the star who had married a planet. And when on the verge of bankruptcy, due to gambling and failed business interests, Murray left all their debts and troubles behind and embarked on a new and passionate affair, this time with a jockey and a man half her age. She left Alec, some say, when he needed her most and moved to a house in Golders Green to live with Bernard Dillon, who was famous for his derby wins as well as the thousand guinea stakes. And he was lauded in the music halls and he was also a sporting pin-up in the magazine Vanity Fair. But Dillon was also infamous for his drinking, bullying and gambling ways. We're seeing a pattern here, aren't we? And he'd lost his riding licence when involved in a betting scandal. So this new relationship was doomed, just as the other two had been, with Dylan resenting the fact that his fame was eclipsed by his wife's flamboyant charm. More scurrilous members of the press wrote of their troubled private life, and perhaps this affected her public persona, when in 1912, Murray was not invited to take part in the very first Royal Command performance, which some said was because of her scandalous life, some because of her crude performing style, and others because of her politics, because of the enemies she'd made within the theatre management when she supported the musicians' strike and lost them a lot of money. Whatever the reason for the slight, Murray, though inwardly furious, refused to be cast aside, performing herself on the very same night where the London, London Pavilion posters announced, Murray Lloyd, Queen of the Halls. Every performance by Murray Lloyd is a command performance by command of the British public. It was a great success. But the gossiping press had a field day, and worse was to come when she and Bernard Dillon embarked on a trip to America, when before they'd even left the ship, someone had informed the authorities that although they'd shared a cabin on board the SS Olympic, they weren't actually married. When detained as undesirables and accused of moral turpitude, the farce was only to carry on when, and I, I love this, when Dillon was arrested on charges of importing Mary Lloyd as a product of the white slave trade. <laughs> <laughs> the affair, it does seem ludicrous now, but Murray was at the end of her tether and later admitted she would never forget the humiliation to which I have been subjected. I shall never sing in America again, no matter how high the salary offered. I wonder if that humiliation was made worse by the fact that her sister Alice, who'd also followed a singing career, has had many other of her siblings, was far more popular in New York. By contrast, when Murray's toll went ahead, even though she played to packed houses, the reviews could be cruel. Her pride was hurt and her guard was down, and perhaps she was trying to hide the pain when the news came from England that Alec Hurley had died of pleurisy and pneumonia. He was only 42 years old, and according to many friends, still professing his love for his wife right up until the bitter end, whereas she responded to that news, with all due respect to the dead, I can cheerfully say that's the best piece of news I've heard in many years, for it means that Bernard, Dylan and I shall marry as soon as this unlucky year ends. Well, Bernard Dillon didn't bring her any luck. The man who she did then legally wed at the British consulate in Portland, Oregon in 1914 was nothing but trouble from the start. But at least when back in England, nearer to friends and family, where Mari felt on a surer footing, she started to door tour provincially again. And then 
1915, when she was 45, she was rolling up her sleeves to take part in the First World War effort, travelling around the country visiting hospitals and factories and entertaining the frontline troops with, now you've got your car key on. That hit performed to 10,000 men in the Crystal Palace in South London. And what a show it must have been with all those soldiers cheering her on. But Bernard Dillon was no less, not, no, not, not as supportive at all. He might have joined the army, but he spent every moment in trying to leave it, claiming that he was too obese to be able to be fit enough for the army life, or that he had to go back to Ireland to care for his family. He really was quite shameless in many, many ways, and Mary came home one night to find her husband in her bed making love to another woman. She endured so many beatings when he was out of his wits with drink that it became quite commonplace for the police to have to intervene and eventually he was sentenced to work a month's hard labour. But only when he assaulted her father, when John Wood, who was by then very old and frail, um, and he was really battered about by her husband, did Mary decide that it was time to make a break for good. Emotionally and physically she was a wreck often drinking herself to ease her woes, and yet she still achieved success with my old man said follow the van when she stood on the stage in a costume of rags and carried a birdcage in one hand to show the plight of the homeless poor. Those forced to do a midnight flit when they couldn't afford to pay the rent. And uh, ironically, as so often before, this song was to mirror Mar Mary's life. Not that she was homeless as such, but she was always traveling about. And despite having earned what were then vast sums, as much as 11,000 pounds a year, her handouts to husbands, family, and friends meant that Mary ended up in debt. Eventually forced to sell the marital home, she went to live in Woodstock Road, another house in Golders Green, but this time owned by her sister Daisy, and a house on which her husband could have no claim. Still, it was hard to make a new start. Murray was being sidelined by other more popular music hall acts, and caught in a downward spiral of grief, this woman who'd reached her half century was no longer young or resilient. She became less and less reliable, very often not showing up for work as illustrated on a night when she should have been on stage at the London Palladium, but she stayed at home to write her will and she wrote her husband out of it. Her act was unpredictable, often stumbling into scenery or else supported by the hand of someone behind the stage curtain. Many times her performance was curtailed, such as on the night in Cardiff when she lasted only six minutes on stage before heading back to her dressing room. And then there was the occasion, cruelly described by Virginia Wood, who saw her at Camden's Bedford Hall and afterwards went on to write of a mass of corruption, long front teeth, a crapulous way of saying desire, and scarcely able to walk, waddling, aged, unblushing. Well, she was a shadow of her former self, and Mary's frame was so shrunken, her face so drawn, that very many people thought she was actually a man in drag on stage. And perhaps severely blackened teeth were the proof that she'd had to use mercury to contain the symptoms of syphilis caught from her promiscuous husband. When on the stage of the London Alhambra, she sang with a greatly weakened voice, it's a bit of a ruin that Cromwell knocked about a bit. And then she collapsed onto the boards as if in a drunken stupor, and the audience roared with laughter because they thought this was all a part of the act, when all along she was dying. And she was taken back to her dressing room, but she never regained consciousness. Mary Lloyd was 52 years old, she was pronounced as dead three days later, having never woken from a coma. And on the death certificate, it said, mitral regurgitation, 14 months, nephritis, 14 months, uremic coma, three days. In short, she died of heart and kidney failure. She must have suffered terribly, but she never wanted pity. Right up until the very end, she pref preferred to put a brave face on things, saying, let them think I died of good living, don't leave them crying. And this sentiment was echoed by the words inscribed on her gravestone. Tired she was, although she didn't show it. Suffering she was, and hoped we didn't know it. But he above, and understanding all, prescribed long rest and gave the final call. But Mary did leave them crying. And she still had one performance to make, which was to be her funeral, with an audience larger than ever in life, with that 100,000 of her fans coming out to line the London roads on Thursday, October the 12th in 1922. T.S. Eliot was so distraught that he wrote an open letter saying that he would not attend any more literary events for months. 
Max Burborn, the famous essayist, wrote that London had not seen a funeral since that, since the death of the Duke of Wellington. Today we can only compare those scenes, and really this is honestly true, with the intense outpourings of grief that were shown for Diana, the Princess of Wales, when so many people had the sense that this was a woman who touched their hearts and they felt they'd lost a personal friend. Mourners came from near and far, with huge crowds gathered in Woodstock Road to where old Kate, who was a race card seller, had walked 75 miles from Newmarket just to be sure of being there. An empty floral birdcage was to signify that in my old man, but no hope of the hundreds of tributes sent being able to fit on the coffin lid. A coffin so small that few could believe it could contain the great Murray Lloyd. The hearse left the house at 11am, topped with Murray's old stage prop, an ebony cane wreathed in orchids. At the cemetery in West Hampstead, mourners stood 12 deep around the grave and eventually they had to shut up the cemetery gates before the interment could actually go ahead. So many wept that autumn day for a woman they said could not be replaced and whether or not she ever was, the musical era had certainly entered its twilight. All the crowds who once leased to laugh and Drank, drink in the halls, no longer so keen on such saucy songs, preferring to dance to jazz instead, or else flocking in droves to cinemas to enjoy the cult of silent film. And then after the horrors of World War II, many more stayed at home with their TV sets, upon which, at one point, they might have been content to watch programmes like The Good Old Days. And that title is a perfect echo for the very first song that the musical queen once sang when she stood in the Grecian Hall. And with that, which I think brings it very nicely to a close for Paul Murray, I'll draw this talk to a close. And I'd like to thank you all for coming along. I can't believe how quickly this has gone by. And I hope you're all as inspired as I am to learn more about Murray Lloyd, because there is so much more to learn and to know. And I'm certainly going to be researching her a great deal more in the future. But I feel that she's one of this city's great stars. And I hope that star continues to shine and be remembered for some time to come. Thank you. Thanks for listening. 32 Londoners was sponsored by Hendrix Gin, who created 32 unique cocktails, one for each capsule and one for each London borough. To hear more talks and for more information on 32 Londoners, go to 32londoners.com. Or for more information on Antique Beat, and a curious invitation, and the other events we create, go to www.antiquebeat.co.uk or a curious invitation.com.